the number one reason that I love making low budget, no budget, micro budget films, whatever you want to call them, is creative freedom. I mean, really, the minute someone writes you a check, and the more substantial the check, the um, less control you have over your finished film. Um, and I've discovered that when I've gotten the bigger checks, there's been a, a level of interference and collaboration that I'm uncomfortable with. Because at the end, you know, if the movie doesn't work, a number of my films haven't worked, whether with an audience or with critics, it's terrible when you know, well, that wasn't my vision. You know, that wasn't my movie. I didn't anticipate that ending or what it, any of the other things that might happen during the, during the process. So I realize, you know, I make smaller dialogue-driven character pieces. So I can tell a version of any one of my films. I can tell the smaller version. And for the most part, it will probably look the same. I may not have the same level of stars in it. Uh, I may not be able to have the type of location where I can pack it with extras. But if it's really, at the end of the day, it's two people communicating, connecting, fighting, whatever the thing is, I can figure out a pretty interesting way to shoot that for a lot less money. And once I realize that, I, that's what I've been doing for, I guess, the last you know four or five films now. And I always talk about there are lists of compromises that a filmmaker can work off of. You know, the list of compromises that you're going to work off of when you make a studio film or even an indie film where you are making a film for several million dollars and you have uh, equity partners and producers is you're going to have to make a lot of creative compromises. There's a lot of chefs in that kitchen. Uh, the list of compromises I have to make when I'm making a micro-budget film is well, I'm not going to be able to cast movie stars. So I know already going into it, I probably will not be looked at for the type of distribution, theatrical distribution, that I might otherwise if I had some stars. Um, this is going to be nothing about the, uh, the bells and whistles, the technique that is going to blow anyone away. You know, we, we can't afford five feet of track, let alone 50 feet of track for that gorgeous shot. We don't use steady cams. we don't use cranes. We have to shoot a lot of times with available light. Um, so there are those types of compromises on the production side. But what I gain is I get to make my films without interference. I get to uh, work with actors who are my friends. I get to uh, sort of work with my crew time and time again. All those people who have given me so much over the years, I get to reward them with that. We work with you know three, four, and five man crews, so everybody works for free and then owns a piece of the movie. And I can tell you like, you know, everyone is making a lot more money this way than if we were making films the other way. So those are just some of the reasons that I've kind of fallen back in love with kind of the way I made Brothers McMullen. What had started to happen in, I guess, the, the second half of the aughts was um, the theatrical business uh, was hurting. You know, just um, you had great companies going out of business, whether it was Paramount Classics or Warner Brother Independent and later a Picture House, Think Film, these companies were disappearing. Um, so you were then also being offered a, um, a deal where it was a no advance partnership. So they'd buy your movie for no money, essentially, claim that they would give you 50% of the profits after they had turned a profit. We had done one of these deals on a movie uh, called Looking for Kitty that I made, which we made for a quarter of a million dollars. Um, that movie definitely turned a profit, and we never saw any money. Um, the other thing was, I had been, just from going around to film festivals and film societies, I had been starting to hear from my audience that basically said, look, if we don't live in New York or LA or Chicago or San Fran, you know, if we're anywhere, if we're in the suburbs, which a big part of my audience is a more suburban audience, mm -hmm. like, th your movies never come to the theater. So I'll see you on Conan, I'll see, you know, an actor, Jay Moore, on, you know, Leno, let's say, for the groomsmen, and the movie never got to my town. So I had to wait the nine months for it to be released on DVD, and by then, quite honestly, you kind of forget about the title. Um, uh, so we knew we had an audience, but we had uh, been having trouble finding them theatrically for the last couple of titles. So Purple Violet's Screens at Tribeca, 
Uh, we have a great screening, and we get a couple of the smaller distribution companies make us a proposal, and it's the no advanced partnership. Mm -hmm. I just thought, why, why do that again? There's no chance for us to make any money here, and we're going to have a tough time reaching the audience. The two most popular TV shows being downloaded at the time, or rented or bought, I guess, were um, uh, it was Sex in the City and I think Grey's Anatomy. Mm -hmm. Purple Violets was uh, sort of had the same audience. Selma Blair played a you know a, a novelist in New York, and it was a romance. And we thought, well, look, if they had that many people are on iTunes already watching that television content that's similar to our movie, why don't we gamble and approach iTunes and see? We did. They thought it was a great idea, the fact that we were the first film, the fact that we were willing to give it to them exclusively. They promoted the hell out of it um, on their site. And it was funny, when we did all the press for that movie, I'd say 75% of the journalists said to me, okay, you're out of your mind. You realize no one is ever going to watch a movie on their computer. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was 07. <laughs> so it's kind of amazing how far we've come in five, six years now. Um, and the movie did uh, surprisingly well when it came out. I mean, the movie cost $4 million. We did not make $4 million. But we made a very significant, you know, number where we thought moving forward, all right, iTunes is a platform that we should think about um, sort of first and foremost because we had, we had already fallen out of love with theatrical. On the next film, what we did was this movie called Nice Guy Johnny. So Nice Guy Johnny was born out of a trying to get another film made. I couldn't get it made. I'm very frustrated in that experience. A, a, a bigger movie, you know, $2 million movie. Um, so my producing partner and I, this guy named Aaron Lubin, um, out of frustration, we kind of, uh, we sat down and said, all right, when I was 25 and I made Brothers McMullen, you know, I had no money, no connections, and didn't know how to make movies. And I made that movie for 25000 and it did all right. Why don't we do the same thing now? So we wrote down sort of our, our list of rules. And it was the sort of the McMullen rules. We were going to shoot in 12 days. The production cost would be no more than 25. we We'd only work with unknown actors. They'd have to do their own hair and makeup. Uh, we wouldn't pay for a single location. Uh, we shoot primarily available light, and we had to shoot the film in 12 days. And uh, with those parameters in mind, I sat down and wrote the script for Nice Guy Johnny. And we made that movie at the end of uh, at the end of post production. It cost 125,000. So when we premiered at uh, at Tribeca, you know, again, offers start coming in for distribution, and John Sloss, my lawyer says, I want you to think about something. Um, if we, because he knew that we were very successful with iTunes, mm -hmm. he goes, if we add VOD to that component, you have an option now where instead of playing in the th two theaters, New York and LA, you can get into 45 million homes. Like, you already did this thing with Purple Violets. You should think strongly about adding this to it and maybe this even becoming the key component. Mm -hmm. And it made sense to me. Uh, so that's what we did, and that movie, with we didn't spend a single cent marketing the movie. Everything was just done through social media, and primarily Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, a little $125,000 movie got into the iTunes uh, top 10. It was just us and Winter's Bone were the only indie movies in the top 25 that week. So that spoke to, okay, we know, that, we know now where our audience is. Mm -hmm. Um, and that movie did very well, so we replicated that on Newlyweds and then replicated again on uh, Fitzgerald's Family Christmas. And now this next film, we're going to even try a, a different version of uh, a digital release. Well, our mutual friend, Ted Hope, is the guy who um, is the one who convinced me that I needed to get, get on Twitter. And I'm sure you've read his blogs. At the time, I think it was 500 true fans. I think now it has to be 5,000 true fans. <laughs> but basically, his argument was, um, it's harder and harder for us to reach our audience. You know, that, that pie uh, uh, that an audience is interested in is being quickly divided into so many more options than existed in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, so he goes, you need to have a, a meaningful relationship with your fans because you're going to need them to do a lot of the marketing work that, let's say, a studio or a record label 
um, or a book publishing company used to do for artists in the past. Um, and that made a lot of sense to me. So we, I just went on Twitter and a big part of it for me was, you know, my director's commentaries on my DVDs, I always was very uh, forthcoming with how we made our movies for nothing. And I uh, always heard from people that they liked that. So I knew I, I'm going to just, I'm going to focus on how I make my movies. And this will just be for like, you know, film students, film geeks who want to figure out how do I make a movie for 25 grand. The other thing was, um, when I'm in film school, I'm walking down 6th Avenue, and I'm about you know, 20 yards behind Spike Lee. And all I want to do is run up to Spike and ask him a thousand questions about how he made She's Gotta Have It. All right? And I don't have the balls to approach Spike on the street, and I missed my opportunity. So I just thought, well, you know what, why don't I use Twitter as that? You know, I'm Spike on the street, kid out there in the Twitterverse, is me 20 yards behind. Now he can approach me and ask the question. And I have to admit, it's, um, I'm surprised how much I enjoy the engagement.